I think what's been really hard for me in this journey was to understand when I have a wife who is so amazing and who I love so much, why this need, this sexual need, was so important that I could bring my marital life to an end, that I couldn't just deal with it and cope with it. It isn't just about sex, there's more to it. There's something that is much more emotional and hard to explain. And I wrestle with this because obviously I got so much love and emotional connection with my wife, but there was something missing. To Grain Rainbows, the podcast community for people coming out LGBT plus later in life. I'm your host, Dr. Ginger Campbell. Wherever you are on your journey, I hope this podcast will help you feel less alone. Before I share today's interview, I want to remind you that you can find more episodes of Grain Rainbows at grainrainbows.com and you can subscribe for free in your favorite podcasting app. You can also get show notes automatically via our free newsletter. Just use the link in the show notes or text Graying Rainbows to 33777. That's graying spelled with an A, Graying Rainbows, all one word, to 33777. I'd love to hear from you. You can send me feedback at grainrainbows at gmail.com. You can also post to the Grain Rainbows fan page on Facebook. On Twitter, it's GrainR. And we also have a private group on MeWe, which I'll tell you about after the interview. There's one other thing I want to mention before I introduce today's guest. I recently got an email from a man in Sweden who mentioned that he started out by listening to only the episodes that featured male guests. But later he went back and listened to the female guests. He was surprised to discover that he got a lot from these interviews. If you do something similar, I want to encourage you to expand your listening and see what happens. My guest today is Dr. Anthony Kay, who lives in Manchester, England. His story is extremely raw and candid, but also very powerful. This interview was actually recorded back in June 2020, so I'm going to be back after the interview to give you a brief update. So my guest today is Anthony Kay from the UK. Tony, it's great to have you on the show today. Thank you. Lovely to be here. I am so glad we finally get to talk. I appreciate your willingness to share your story. And what I usually like to do is just let people start off by sharing their story in whatever way feels comfortable. Does that work for you? Yeah, that's great. So where would you like to start? I think I'd like to go back to my late teens, early 20s. I was at medical school in the UK, training to be a doctor. And I think that was the time when I lived away from home for the first time in my life, as do many students. And I was aware or becoming aware that I was probably bisexual. And I wrestled with that dilemma. I did not think of myself as gay. I was uh, pretty sure that I had feelings for both sexes. Uh, I had already been going out with a girl for some considerable time before I went to medical school, although that relationship was ended for a period. And I just knew that I had feelings towards men and women. What year was that? That would have been around 1974. So that's a few years before I started. I started in 1980. So what was the climate like in the UK at that point toward bisexuality? I mean, homosexuality only became legalized in the UK in 1967. So we're talking seven years after that. And I think there was very much negativity towards anything of a bisexual or homosexual nature. And it was very much closeted in the UK. Obviously, it's well before the days of the internet. And, you know, if you wanted to find out anything, you had to buy a magazine 
where you could perhaps find out where there was a gay club or, or that sort of thing. So it was it was very much hidden and closeted at that time. So I, I actually started to struggle with some mental health issues as a result of this conflict. I grew up in a middle-class, professional, Jewish family background, and, and you can probably appreciate from me telling you that, that the various pressures that were upon me at that period to conform with so many aspects of life. My parents were very traditional, not particularly religious, but very traditional. And I had a typical Jewish mother who had high expectations of me getting married, having children, etc. I suppose I just tried to suppress everything at that time and, and get on with my studies. But I did have to, as I say, go through a period of counselling because of the conflict I was feeling inside. And I decided at that point that I would just get on with my life. And as I was bisexual, it would be fine. Eventually, I re reacquainted um, with the girl that I had been seeing before I went to medical school. And she ultimately became my wife. And we married at the end of my studies when I graduated as a doctor. And we settled into a traditional Jewish family life. My wife was Jewish as well. And um, everything seemed to be going reasonably well. I think at that point that I had actually, I won't say totally suppressed it, but I think I was very happy with her. I loved her to bits. And we got on with our professional careers and two children came along in the 1980s. Sorry, I, I omitted to say that we married in 1979, which was the year that I graduated from medical school. So we settled back into married life and got on with what you do, educating the children, both working very hard. And it wasn't until about 12 years ago from now, so that would be around about 2008, approximate, these, it's approximate, when the penny dropped. And I realized at that point that I was not bisexual. It was a bolt of lightning to me because I realized I'd been kidding myself and I didn't know what to do about it. I think there were some times during the, the years after that that I contemplated coming out to my wife and particularly to my brother. I just have one brother and we're very close. There was an opportunity on one occasion for me to tell my brother and I couldn't bring myself to do it. By this point, of course, my children were adults and getting on with their own lives and their own careers in very different directions. One of my sons has become quite religious within Orthodox Judaism, and my other son has chosen to go in completely the opposite direction, very much culturally Jewish, but not religious at all. So that created some slight difficulties for me in terms of how they would ever deal with this situation. So I reached a point approximately 12 months ago, which was around about March 2019. And that was the point when I, the stresses within me had created a massive amount of inner torment and turmoil. I had retired from work early at the age of 58 partly to do with work-related stress, which culminated in uh, anxiety and depression. And I'd had several episodes over my professional life, but I always knew in those last few years that the sexuality issue was a contributory factor in my mental health issues, but I had never been able to share that with anybody, not even my own family doctor, who was very supportive in each of these situations. But around about 12 months ago, I decided for whatever reason, and I don't exactly know, I don't really know why that last few years I'd managed to suppress it, but then it built up to a point where I felt I needed to do something about it. And as you can probably appreciate, I was terrified because I'd become very much involved in my community. I had my professional status. I had my family status. Uh, the religious Jewish community, which is such a small minority. And all of these things created pressures where I felt if I came out that I would be 
I would be rejected or I would be humiliated or I would feel uncomfortable. And when you're in the position that I'm in, in that sort of life situation, I think it's difficult to appreciate what it could be like on the other side. What I actually chose to do as a first step was to go and see a local rabbi. And this particular local rabbi is from a reform community, which is a more progressive form of Judaism. And the reason I chose to go and see him is because he's gay. And I thought that he would appreciate the, some of the difficulties, even though he was gay and he hadn't been through a marriage and hadn't been bisexual. But I thought that he would be a good person to contact. And we vaguely knew one another previously through other connections. And I went to see him and he was wonderful. Um, I had a a really good cry when I was with him. He was very supportive and actually has become a really good friend since then. And we are now regularly in touch on a more social level. What he did was he put me in touch with one of his congregants who was a man slightly older than me, who had also been through a marriage and had come out and is now living happily with his male partner. And this guy was really welcoming and friendly to me and supportive and even did some sort of mentoring of me at that point. I wouldn't say counselling, more mentoring. The upshot of seeing both of them was that I sort of knew what I had to do. I'd reached the point really of no return. And so I, I decided I had to tell my wife. Now, at that point, we were just coming up to our 40th wedding anniversary. And we had had a happy marriage. We love each other. We still do. We had reached the point where we were more financially secure. I had retired from work, as I said. She was still working because she wants to continue to work in her line of work. It was the time of our lives when really we should be thinking about the future together, spending more time together. It would be true to say that our intimate life had diminished to the point of non-existence. And that was because of me. We never discussed it because I was embarrassed to talk about it. And she didn't really ask me much about it. And I think there was just probably a tacit acceptance that maybe at this stage of our lives, it was not that necessary. The truth was that I knew that I still did have a libido. It was just in the wrong direction. And you can appreciate how difficult that was. But that was, in a way, part of what led me to realising that I had to make this choice because it was difficult to go on and on pretending that everything was fine. So I sat my wife down and I said to her, that she had remarked to me not that long before that I didn't tell her I loved her as much as I used to do. And so I thought that was a good opening line to start the conversation. And I said, look, you said to me that I don't tell you I love you. I said, the truth is, I do love you. I love you as much, if not more, than I ever have. But there's something you need to know about me. I'm just going to come out and say it, that I'm gay. I thought I was bisexual and I thought that for a long time and that I could live with it, but I realized that I couldn't. And now I have to be completely honest with you because I can't live with this anguish, this torment that I feel inside and that it's contributed to my ill health. I just need to be honest. Whatever the consequences of me telling you, I have to tell you. Obviously, we talked at great length that particular evening. And she was astonishing. We both obviously cried, but I expected a reaction that I didn't get. And the reason I expected a reaction was that I had done some research prior to that occasion when I looked up online about married gay men or women, I suppose, coming out to their partner and the the reactions to expect, uh, anger, and to be totally rejected. I didn't get any of that. She was loving. She said, this is not your fault. You know, I knew that she had no, not a homophobic bone in her body at all from conversations in the past. But this is different when it's you and it's your life partner who you love. And she just was incredible. She, she hugged me. 
She told me that she loved me and she's been the same ever since. And we're now 15 months down the line. So we talked at length. We didn't make any decisions, life-changing decisions at that point because it was too early to do that. And what happened from that moment was once we talked it through, was that I, we agreed we wanted to tell our two sons and we wanted to tell them together. In other words, we wanted to be together and we wanted them to be together. And the problem with that was that um, my two sons were not both in the country at the same time because my younger son often works abroad in show business. So we have, as I'm sure most families do, we have a family WhatsApp group and we ask the boys to come to find a date where we could get together as soon as possible. And my boys assumed that we just wanted to have a family night out. But actually, I explained that that was not the case and we wanted to meet up and we wanted them to come to the house because there was something we needed to tell them. I'll just digress briefly to say that my younger son's immediate response at the age of 34 was, are we adopted? <laughs> so I just responded and said, well, have you looked in the mirror? And, that, and uh, he was just being flippant. But it took us two weeks to get the boys together. And they obviously, during that time, must have had conversations between themselves about what they thought was going on. And the two things that they had suggested to us was, A, was one of us ill? And the other one was, were we getting divorced? And so we told them that neither of those situations applied and we didn't want to discuss it by WhatsApp. And we wanted to wait till we were all together and they would just have to accept that. So they came to the house and we sat them down and I told them in exactly the same way as I told my wife. Their reaction was shock, which of course was to be expected. They had not obviously suspected anything. I, again, I know that both of my sons have no ounce of homophobia in them. But again, it's different when it's your dad. We all got upset, but they were amazing. They were very supportive and wanted to be there for both of us. They hugged us both and just said that they would do whatever they could to be there for both of us in whatever happened. So that was a, you know, a very difficult evening and they needed to then go away and, and, and digest the information. My wife, again, through that evening was also just loving and supportive to me. I then said I wanted to tell my brother. I just have the one brother and his wife. And so a few days later, I went to tell him. I was really surprised at how positive he was. First of all, he had no idea, which surprised me, but he had no idea. And he told his wife, and they, ever since that day, have been wonderfully supportive to me, regularly in contact with me and with my wife, who they also love. And basically just there for me, whatever I needed and whatever my wife needed. And that's where we sort of left things for a while. We were both getting used to the idea of this situation and we didn't know how it was going to work out and where we were going to go. I then felt that I needed some counselling to help me to decide because, strange as it may seem, I hadn't formulated a plan as to what I would do next. I contacted the LGBT Foundation in Manchester online and they have a counselling service. And I thought, well, that sounds a good idea because they're going to be geared towards people with issues relating to their sexuality. And so I went on their waiting list and my wife and I also agreed that we would go to the relationship counselling together. And we went along to the first session and we explained our situation. My wife then went to a session on her own and I went to a session on my own and then we went together again. So this was over a period of a few weeks. And my wife came out after that and she said, this is pointless because we actually don't have a problem in our relationship. We have a problem, but it's not because we don't love each other. It's not knowing what we're going to do. At this point, I had also started to, well, I had 
contact with the rabbi that I mentioned earlier and the, the chap who mentored me and I started counselling. So I had a support mechanism that was developing. But of course, at this point, none of my friends, our friends knew anything about this. And the way our friends probably perceived us was as the perfect couple because our interests, our hobbies, whilst we were a couple who accepted that we had different things that we like to do, but we saw that very much as a positive, but we also had lots of things that we like to do together. And we finished each other's sentences, so we were very much telepathic towards one another. After all, at that point, we'd been together nearly 47 years. I'm doing the counselling, and my wife then came to me and she said, look, I think I need some support as well. You've got some supporting network there. And we agreed that, well, she said she wanted to tell a few close friends. And so we agreed. We invited couples, one just one couple at a time, to come to the house and to sit them down and tell them what we were going through. The interesting reaction was that they all got very emotional. We didn't expect that. I mean, they, they literally were tearful. These are people that we've been friends for the whole of our married life. And they had not expected any of this. And we said to them, you don't have to choose between us because we are fine together. We can socialize together still, and we're still continuing to do some of the things that we've always done. I want to break in here briefly to remind you that I'm always looking for listeners who are willing to share their stories. Wherever you are on your journey, your story can help others feel less alone. Just write to me at grainrainbows at gmail.com. Part of the reason for the counseling was so that I could formulate a decision as to how I was going to move on with my life. And there were really four options. And the first option was that we would stay together, we would live together, that I would try and put the lid back on the box and suppress how I felt and carry on as if nothing had happened. That was really option one. Option two was that we would continue to live together, but I would have time out. And this was actually interestingly my wife's suggestion. She said, what if we, you know, we live together, we, we share the house, but you go away for the odd weekend or the odd night out or what have you. Now, whether she could have lived with that, I don't know, but that was her suggestion. Option three was that I move out and live alone and try and find this new life. And option four was that we get divorced. We immediately excluded options one and four. And when I was going through the counselling, we were trying to, I would go week after week and one week I would be in favour of trying to stay at home and the second week I would go and we would be thinking I have to move out and we went round the houses and then eventually we settled on the fact that I had to move out because option two, living at home but going out for bad behaviour, if you like, would feel sleazy and it would feel uncomfortable and it wouldn't be fair to her and it wouldn't be fair to me. It just was not a workable option. As I said earlier, I'd read about what happens in these situations and it seemed as though we were following the path that maybe our marriage was going to come to an end, that we were going to go our separate ways. I think what's been really hard for me in this journey was to understand when I have a wife who is so amazing and who I love so much, why this need, this sexual need was so important that I could bring my marital life to an end, that I couldn't just deal with it and cope with it. One of my friends, when we told him the situation, asked me to go out because we told him him with his wife together and he said, can we go out for lunch next week? These are some questions I'd like to ask you. And when we went out, he, he said to me, can I be very personal? I said, of course you can. And he said, is it all about sex? He said, because at our age, I was 64, almost 64. He said, at our age, you know, let's be honest, it's maybe not so important in our lives. 
And I said to him, no, it isn't about that. It isn't just about sex. There's more to it. There's something that is much more emotional and hard to explain. And I wrestled with this because obviously I got so much love and emotional connection with my wife, but there was something missing. When I've recounted that particular incident to friends and to some gay people, what I've realized is all my straight friends don't get it. They think it's all about sex. When I tell a gay man, they totally get it and they understand the feeling, the need of that that something that was missing from inside me that I couldn't put my finger on it, but I would be lying if I didn't say that I hadn't had some sexual encounters. So that's on the table because clearly I wouldn't have known if I was truly gay if that hadn't happened. I can say that when I am intimate with a man, and I'm not talking about sex, but when I am intimate with a man, there's something that just feels entirely complete within me. And that was the piece of the jigsaw that seems to be missing from my married life. So time was passing. My wife, we told a few friends, and that was difficult because every conversation took about two hours to go through this. And to be fair, by the time we were telling our friends, which was several months after I'd come out to my wife, we'd made the decision we were going to live separately. And interestingly, when we were telling friends, they were almost more shocked about the fact we weren't going to be living together. I think they'd sort of expected that what we would say is that, yes, I'm gay. Yes, my wife is being totally accepting of it, but we're going to carry on as we are. So it was a shock to them. Fast forward again. So this was through the summer. We had our 40th wedding anniversary in the middle of all of this. And prior to any of the coming out experience, we'd planned some special event for our anniversary and we were going to take the family. I have three granddaughters. We were going to take them all away on holiday, which actually we did, but we cancelled the party that we were going to have because I said to my wife, I can't stand up in front of all our guests and say the things, yes, of course, I still love you, but I can't do that when they all know what's going on. So that was a traumatic period for us, as you can, I'm sure, appreciate. We then reached a point where my wife said to me, I think we can't spend the time telling everybody individually. So I think we need to find another way. What about if you were to prepare an email, which explains this situation? So that's what we chose to do. I prepared an email. She approved it. I didn't even have to make a change, which was interesting. And we sent it out to lots of people. And she said to me, why did you send it to so many people? And I said, because it's going to go public. We have controlled it up until now, but now it's going to go public. And I want people to hear it the way we want to tell it, the way it is for us, not gossip and scandal. And obviously it'll then drift out more widely. I think the point that I want to make publicly here is that I was ready. I was ready to go public. I had already begun to feel liberated about coming out and people knowing that I was gay. That weight, that massive pressure had disappeared. But my wife obviously took longer to get to that point. And every step of the way since I told her, we'd gone at her her pace and her choice. And she was terrified about the reaction of going public. But what I want the listeners to know, which is partly the reason why I was quite keen to do this, is that despite the fact that I live in this middle class, as I said earlier, middle class, professional, Jewish, heterosexual world, I didn't have another gay friend. Not one person has shown me anything other than love, support, kindness. If there is anybody out there in my network that feels badly towards me or has homophobic issues, they have not expressed it to me. And all I can say is I have been overwhelmed with the love and people to this day still contacting me, wanting to see me. And I still see my wife a lot. We share certain activities, hobbies that we still do together. And we see them, I see the family at 
family occasions. Um, so it's been uplifting for me to experience what I did not think I would experience. It's not all perfect. Everything that I've described so far sounds like a romanticized version of what it could be. There are so many positives. I've been lucky enough to move into a lovely home. Living alone on a practical level is easy for me, but I never wanted to live alone. I've never lived alone. And emotionally, that is a real battle. And I moved out in October of 2019. And I was starting to network in Manchester, where I live. There is a large gay community and there is lots of gay activity. And I, I didn't know where to start. So I found out online that there is a website called Meetup. I don't know whether that's international, but it's certainly in the UK. And I entered my location and I entered LGBT. And all of these sort of groups popped up, activities and events and things you could go to social things, coffee and chat things and, and nights out and, and so on. And I started to make some new friends through this networking. And I realized that I do not understand the gay world. It is so different from everything I knew. And certainly gay men and I think women are so much more upfront about everything. Conversations with people are so intimate compared to the heterosexual world that I knew. But I felt as if I was beginning to make some progress in that field. And then what happens? Coronavirus appears. So in the UK from March, everything has been locked down. And that's been really difficult for me to negotiate because I'm very much isolated in my accommodation. Obviously, I see people at a distance, but a lot of what I was hoping to develop has ground to a halt. And I am emotionally struggling at the moment. And I'm trying to wrestle with guilt. In all of this, and even at my lowest points, when I think about the fact that I've come out publicly and that people know, I feel a massive sense of relief liberated and so so happy that people are able to be the way they are with me that they still show so much love for me but yet I feel so guilty towards my wife my children are adults and they have their own lives and they are wonderful with me and wonderful with my wife but I don't feel guilty towards them now they will find their way through this it's only to do with my wife and so I've made a decision recently that I need to go back to counselling, which I've started to do, just to try and help me to work through this guilt. So would you say the guilt is the, the hardest part of the journey so far? Without doubt. Well, it's the hardest part of the journey since I came out, because the years of how I was struggling to cope with my sexuality before was tough, very tough. But now. Yes, the guilt is the hardest thing to deal with. If I'm completely honest, what I would say is that being gay has ruined my life. Now, that sounds extremely negative when in, in so much of what I've described is, is quite positive. But it ruined my life in, in trying to cope with what I had to cope with before I came out. And now I've moved out and starting to live this new life. I'm still struggling. And I can't yet work out in my mind how this is all going to end up. I suppose I want people to know that I feel that it was the right thing to do. Should I have done it earlier? Could I have done it earlier? I've asked myself that many times because I'm conscious of the fact that for a man of 64 to suddenly go out there and try and build new relationships after a long marriage is difficult. And the other thing I wrestle with is the fact that my wife has been so amazing because had she rejected me and had she shown anger, almost like a bereavement reaction, a similar sort of uh, period you go through, I would have hated that. But would it have been easier for me to deal with? I don't know. And I am so grateful that she hasn't done that. But yet 
that is creating this inner guilt. And obviously, there may come a point when somebody special comes into my life and I have to introduce that guy to the family. And that's a hurdle I'll cross when I get to it. But yes, for the moment, the guilt is there and I am trying to deal with it in the best way I can. In talking about your wife, I know this isn't intentional on your part, but you've almost described her as if her position was sort of static. And that doesn't, I, I'm sure that's not true. Do you check in with her to see how her feelings are evolving? I'd be surprised if she doesn't have at least times when she feels angry and mad and maybe just doesn't tell you about them. I'm sure that's right. Um, how could she not have that? But her way of dealing with things which has made me realise how much stronger emotionally she is than I am, is she keeps herself extremely busy. She has various work commitments and social commitments. In fact, one of her close friends, who's a relative of mine, but a close friend of hers, I was chatting with yesterday, and she said that she worries slightly that my wife is sort of throwing herself into too much as a way of distracting herself from what she's feeling. The issue I have, in a way, is because we're so friendly and still so close, is how much time should we spend together and how much should I actually be asking her how she is and how she's dealing with it? And I've had some vibes from my sons and from one or two friends who imply that maybe we should have less contact with one another. And I find it difficult to do that. And I think she would find that difficult. I'm slightly reluctant to too often probe into how she's feeling because I don't know whether it's my right to do that now. She will deal with this in the way that she will deal with it. And is it fair for me to ask her how she's coping and if she's coping? But occasionally I do. And I just usually will start off by just asking her, how are you feeling? And then see where the conversation develops from there. But to expect her to open up to me about her inner anger, if there is any, maybe that's for other people, for her friends. Maybe the best you can do is just let her know that you're there if she wants to talk about it, but that you're not going to push her. She knows that. And in every way, I mean, she knows that I'm here for whatever she needs. She still calls on me to do things for her on a practical level, I'll be the first bird to call. And we still have hugs and we still see one another quite frequently. Well, it is uh, certainly not my place to offer analysis or advice, but I have talked to a lot of people and I would say that, what do you say, 15 months out? That's really a very short amount of time on the, compared to how long you were married, especially. Yeah, absolutely. So that's why I really appreciate you being willing to share your story in its raw, who knows how it's going to end form. I mean, if somebody has been out a long time, certain things have been resolved. Whereas like you and I are both in the same situation of, you know, we still haven't even had that, that first special person. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm aware that I'm on, the, I'm on the journey, but I'm still back at the starting blocks, really. Well, you know, we've all been, you know, sort of set back by this coronavirus thing. I mean, the opportunities to socialize aren't that great where I live, but I did have some that I neglected that as soon as, you know, the lockdown started, I was like, well, why wasn't I going to that monthly meetup that I could have gone to? And, yeah, and of course, it's June, which is usually, you know, a big month for Pride. And here in Alabama, it's always early in June. Last year at this time, we were busy getting our float ready for the parade. And now we're just like, this is not something that virtual really replaces. Well, it's interesting because in Manchester, we have, as I mentioned, a very large LGBT community. And, and we have what we call the gay village, which is an area of streets which are totally devoted really to gay bars and, and lots of gay activity. And there's a massive gay pride event in Manchester. I'm not sure that I'm ready yet to participate in that. But the decision doesn't have to happen now because there is no pride <laughs> this year. So uh, I'm just, you know, whilst I'm happy to be out and I'm happy to be public, 
I'm not sure that I'm ready to go and stand on a float and wave the banners <laughs> and wear my feather boa and hot pants. <laughs> well, actually, the float I was on last year was a Unitarian Church float. So most of the people on the float weren't even gay. <laughs> About half of them were. <laughs> yeah. The guy dressed as Dorothy, definitely, because our theme was the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Well, let's see. No, I didn't do Pride the very first when I first came out either, no. I need to take just a moment to remind you that you can help support Grain Rainbows financially by going to patreon.com forward slash grain rainbows. Patreon allows you to make a monthly donation that fits your budget. The money goes to offset costs such as hosting and especially audio editing. Your support is greatly appreciated. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we close? Tony, you've done a great job of really being open with us, and I really appreciate it. Thinking about the reasons for doing this and why I contacted you in the first place, having listened to the podcast and having listened to some other people who've come out. And what's obviously unique about your particular podcast is that it relates to people coming out later in life. Because I think that's so different to people who choose to come out in their early years, um, not having had a marriage or, or whatever else. And I just felt that if by me sharing my story, even though it's not complete and it's not perfect, but it's for me at the moment, it's the best it could be. I have my friends, I have my wife, I have my family, and they're all there for me. And that's a real positive. And I want to give that positive message out there. And in all the angst that I felt, and in this, the angst that I still feel over the guilt that I described, I don't regret coming out because I finally feel I can be true to who I really am. We're so fortunate that we live in a time when most people are moving beyond homophobia, you know, except for certain groups. And so coming out is becoming a different process than it would have been if you had tried to do it even 10 years ago, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because as, as we said at the beginning, you know, what was it like when I was in my late teens? It had barely become legal in the UK. And, you know, there would have been no question as to the reaction that I would have probably encountered at that time. I think it would have been so difficult within my social and religious community. I think it would have been impossible. And anyway, I hadn't even accepted I was gay at that point. I just I just thought I was bisexual, as I say. It has taught me what a different world it is. And living in this straight world that people of my age are so willing to and so receptive to the idea that one of their close lifelong friends has been wrestling with this and now is out and gay and they still love me. And that's amazing. We as mature adults, we have our lives. And I think it's important to know that even if we might have to be willing to give up relationships or even bits of our lives, it's not like we have to suddenly become a different person. You're just more whole. I suppose if I'm honest, what would, what would my aspiration be for the future? Obviously, I hope that within time, and I'm not ready for it yet, but in time, there will be somebody special who'll come into my life. But I don't want to wipe out the 40 years that I've had with my wife. And what I would like to think, and I don't know if this is possible, that we'll still be friends. And she'll still continue to be some part in, in that new life somewhere. Now, other people may say, well, how can that be? I don't know. And I don't know, <laughs> but we'll see. A lot of people who get divorced just because they drift apart or whatever, a lot of people who get divorced are able to be friends. So why should this be any different? Yeah, true. I mean, there are certain reasons why one would get divorced that might that might make that impossible. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of divorces aren't because of that. And people, especially people who have children, they have to continue to work together with their children. So I don't think that that's an unrealistic expectation. I mean, just, just thinking about, I don't see how, why it should be any different. One thing we touched upon, which I didn't mention, well, I, I just passed over the fact that I have three granddaughters uh, from my elder son. My younger son does not have children. 
And I know that my elder son was very concerned about what to tell the children. And indeed, he didn't want to tell the children for quite some time until he knew what our direction of travel was going to be. But he has told them now, and the eldest one is going to be 12 this year, and the youngest is five. It's interesting because, again, they live, as I explained earlier, they live in a more religious part of the Jewish world. And yet the two older ones know the full story. The younger one does not know the full story. But they know that grandma and grandpa are not living together anymore. And the two older ones know that grandpa's gay. They've just passed it over. And I asked my son recently, I said, have they asked about it? And he said, no, since I told them, they've never mentioned it. And they haven't asked me anything about it. Because obviously in the lockdown period, we've had Zoom or, or WhatsApp or FaceTime video chats. And they'll say, oh, where are you, Grandpa? Are you in your flat? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you, I think you call it an apartment. I watch British TV. I know what a flat is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or a condo. So they know, but they haven't mentioned it. And they just, I think that's an indication of, the way the world is now, that it's just accepted. So I usually ask people what the biggest surprise has been, and I think you kind of have already answered this, but what comes to your mind when I ask you, what's the biggest surprise? I think I would have to say, which I've talked about probably over and over again in this interview, is, is the reaction of my friends and family and the love that I continue to receive. I was terrified of how people would treat me. And I include my wife in that. I was terrified that I would lose everything that I'd built up over a lifetime. And I haven't. And that's been the biggest surprise in a positive way. And there hasn't been a big surprise in a negative way. If you know that you're gay and you're in a relationship, don't leave it so long. Don't be afraid because I know there are people who are, who are so still afraid. You have to ultimately be true to who you are. The people that matter won't mind, but the people that mind really don't matter. And so don't avoid doing what you know deep down you have to do, because the world is very accepting of gay people now. And be true to yourself. Of course, I'm sure there may be some listeners who live in places where that is still not the safe choice, but that's implied that you would only do that if it if you live someplace where it where it is safe. But the world is changing, and most parts of the world are a lot better than they used to be. Well, I mean, yes, I can only really speak for the UK. I mean, I don't even know what it's like in certain parts of America, although, yes, I mean, obviously other parts of the world, but even within the United States, I know there are areas where it is very difficult. And I think another thing I want to go back to right before we close is you talked about what you did when you first were getting ready to come out, when you went and spoke with the rabbi. There might be an important core idea there of, of finding a person, start with somebody, connect to somebody, even if that's somebody on our, on our little MeWe group or emailing me, connecting to somebody so that you're just not out there all by yourself. It's a very lonely place to be feeling the way I was feeling because there wasn't a single person in the world that knew how I was feeling inside. Actually, that's not entirely true because there was another chap that I had met who actually was going through a similar situation at a similar time to me and we became friendly and we've been supporting one another throughout this process. And on my down days, he would help me through it. And on his bad days, I would help him through it. And fortunately, our bad days rarely coincided. <laughs> but yes, I think you have to have a go-to person. You have to have somebody that you can run it past to see, to get some understanding of, of how best to approach your next steps. I think that's important. And in my case, yes, that rabbi was the, the first person for me. And I didn't go to him really because he was religious. I went to him because he was within the community and he was gay. And I felt he would have an understanding. So I think it's who you go to 
you probably have to choose quite carefully. Somebody that you know you can trust and feel comfortable to talk to. It may be somebody that you already know very well, or you may prefer it to be somebody on the outside, which is what I chose to do. We can't go it alone because human beings are, we're wired to be social. That's why this lockdown is so hard on people's mental health. It's astonished me, really. I feel slightly guilty about, about it because people are living in much worse circumstances than I am. And I think, well, I have a lovely home. I'm very grateful for that. And, but yet, not being able to get close to the people that you love and to socialize with is really tough really tough and tougher than I think any of us can possibly imagine and not knowing when the end's going to come to it either. You know, I find myself, you may find this ironic as a citizen of the UK, but from the very beginning, I've been thinking about the Blitz because, you know, when the Blitz first started. Before our time. Yeah, before our time, (laughs) but it's a period that really fascinates me. At first people thought, oh, this will be over in a few months, right? In fact, the people in London sent their kids out to the country, right? And then a lot of them brought them back into the city before the worst of the Blitz actually happened because they're like, oh, well, it's not going to. And then, you know, it went on for years. But the difference was, even though the people had to spend every night in the underground, they were together. They developed a whole sense of community down there in the underground. They were in it together. They weren't isolated. Yeah, we've talked about that amongst friends, about that very aspect of it that however bad it was, you could be together, you could help one another, and you could love one another. So I I don't know what the solution is, because if we don't figure out a way to tap into that need, it'd be so easy for, for the forces of divisiveness to be very destructive. Part of humanity is the social contact we have with one another. And this is so against everything that we as human beings are, that it's impossible to navigate through it. I don't think you can really understand the feelings and the emotions till you're in it. And now we're in it, we're having to deal with those emotions. And that's completely irrespective of my personal situation. This is for everybody. And I just think there has to come a point where we have to balance the risks and the benefits. And I, as a doctor, am used to dealing in gray areas. And I think that for a lot of the public, it's very black and white. And our government is giving us a strict advice on what we shouldn't do and what we're permitted to do. And there are people who are, okay, there are many who are not, but the, the majority are trying to adhere exactly and have become, to be honest, some people have become completely neurotic about it. But I'm much more philosophical that we have to try and find a balance. And so maybe I'm prepared to step over the line a little bit, but that's personal choice. But humanity is not meant to live apart from one another. No, I agree with you. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me, and I look forward to to sharing this interview with the world. So thanks again. I just hope that if, if one person feels something that it's able to enable them to move on from the difficulty that they're experiencing, then it was worthwhile telling my story. First, I want to thank Dr. Anthony Kay for sharing his story. If you find his story helpful, please let me know by writing to me at grainrainbows at gmail.com. I'll pass your feedback on to Tony. You can also post to the Grain Rainbows fan page on Facebook or to our private group on MeWe. The reason we moved the private group from Facebook is for better privacy. If you would like to join, send me an email at grainrainbows at gmail.com. If you're already a member, please take a moment to post your comments about this month's episode. Several things stood out for me when I went back to listen to our conversation. First is the importance of finding support. Tony started with a rabbi that he happened to know was gay, who then connected him with another gay man, who surprisingly was the first one that he would really come to know. And this illustrates the point that finding another LGBT person can be hard if you have spent your life in the straight world. 
But as Tony pointed out, if you do know somebody who is LGBT, that might be a good place to look for support. He also pointed out that it's really hard to navigate the LGBT world when you spent your whole life in the straight world. Now, in terms of finding support for listeners in the United States, I highly recommend PFLAG. That's capital P-F-L-A-G. This is the oldest organization in the country for LGBT people, their families, and friends. Their website is pflag.org. And of course, there's lots of other online resources, including this podcast. Another thing that Tony reminded us was that there are special challenges for those who deeply love their straight spouses. And I've gotten a lot of emails about this, so I know it's actually very common. How much time should you spend together? And then there's the whole issue of struggling with guilt, which brings up the importance of finding a good counselor. Finally, Tony reminds us that being gay is not just about sex. It's about finding a deeper level of intimacy. I mentioned in the introduction that this interview was recorded in June 2020, which was fairly early in the COVID pandemic. In November, I asked Tony to give me an update because I wanted to know how he was doing, and I knew you would, too. This is what he wrote to me via email. Tony's struggling with the ongoing restrictions and living alone because he never intended to live alone for an extended period. He has managed to maintain the contacts he made in the LGBT community, but nothing has developed beyond a few friendships. He wrote, I'm feeling that I need someone special to come into my life, someone to cuddle, someone to share experiences, someone to love. He also wrote, I'm a social animal and am feeling very lonely with things as they are. I have lots of contact with family, with old and new friends, so I'm not isolated, but no one wants to meet because legally we're not allowed to. And also group meetups and places like pubs are still unavailable. He has seen a lot of his wife, who I'm going to call L for the rest of this recording for her privacy. She moved into a smaller house on her own and they sold their home where they'd lived for nearly 30 years. Elle continues to cope by staying busy, and she seems happy that they've remained close friends. They have dinner together fairly often, sometimes with one of their sons, and sometimes just one-on-one. -on -one. He's also working with a therapist and is focusing on dealing with his guilt, especially with regards to how Elle is being impacted by his decision to come out. Tony wrote, So, in a nutshell, life has been pretty static since we spoke in June because of the pandemic. Apart from the house sale and Elle's move, I love my apartment and feel very comfortable here. It's well located geographically in South Manchester and near my children and my wife. I remain optimistic that in the new year, I will be able to get out there and start living again. I have to admit to periods of very low mood, almost depressive, but other periods where I feel optimistic. I've learned that I truly don't like living alone, not because of practicalities, but emotionally it's not good for me. I've always known that I'm a sociable person, but this last eight months has really tested me and continues to do so. When we originally talked, Tony mentioned the challenge of trying to fit into the LGBT community. In this email, he also mentioned the challenge of trying to figure out how to date in the 21st century. I'm sure that many of you can identify with these challenges. I'd really like to encourage you to get in the MeWe group on Facebook and share your challenges with each other to help each other feel less isolated. There is one thing that I keep forgetting to remind you about, and that's about the second edition of my book, Are You Sure? The Unconscious Origins of Certainty. You can buy this from your favorite online bookseller as either an ebook or as a paperback. But if you'd like an autographed copy for only $20, just write to me at grainrainbows at gmail.com. I also want to thank all of those of you who are supporting Graying Rainbows via Patreon. 
If you want to check this out, go to patreon.com forward slash graying rainbows. I want to remind you that you can find more episodes of Graying Rainbows at grayingrainbows.com and you can subscribe for free in your favorite podcasting app. And if you want to get show notes automatically, sign up for our newsletter. There's a link in the show notes or you can text Graying Rainbows, all one word, to 33777. That's Graying Rainbows with an A, all one word, to 33777. Seven, seven. Finally, please email me at grainrainbows at gmail.com if you're interested in sharing your story. I'll be back next month with another interview. And until then, I hope you'll listen to my other podcasts, Brain Science and Books and Ideas. Thanks again for listening. I look forward to talking with you again very soon. Grain Rainbows is copyright 2020 to Virginia Campbell, MD. You may copy it to share it with others, but for any other uses or derivatives, please contact me at grainrainbows at gmail.com.